Hello, everybody. Um, uh, first, I've got to start with an apology. I was going to live stream this uh, debate that's up and coming. Um, I put up the stream on YouTube and um, I had problems with my OBS, so it didn't connect. And I had problems getting rid of the stream. So I really do apologize. This wasn't live streamed. Um, there was some technical difficulties, but I am trying to get this up as soon as possible so uh, everybody can watch it. Um, the person who I was supposed to debate against also didn't show up for the second time in a row. Um, strangely enough, we had probably a better outcome, somebody in the audience who had just joined the modern day debate server called Tonlock um, decided to step up and argue for the death penalty. As I understand it, it's one of Darth Dawkins' um, supporters. So he was debating the death penalty and sort of got on to presuppositionalism. So it kind of is this this weird side track of getting onto pre-sup apologetics um, that that kind of turned interesting, and I think that um, he sort of you, you could you notice all of the beats of of Darth Dawkins that he hits. You know, you answer my question, and then I'll answer yours. Um, that's not the answer, or you know, sort of not accepting your answer. A lot of the beats are being hit, but um, I, again, I really do apologize. This 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 one's been such a such a mess. And um, I'll endeavour to try and do better in the future when it comes to this stuff. Strangely enough, the one last week seemed to work fine, so I'm not sure what happened here. But again, I, I really apologise for the confusion. Uh, I hope you enjoy it. or something far less severe than the death penalty itself. Well, it's not more capable, but, you know, if, if, if both are getting the same result, then why, why kill people? Uh, the same result in terms of what? That there's no... Are you saying that, like, there's determined. no statistical difference in the kind of crime that happens? Like, crime statistics are, like, average out the same to whether you have the death penalty or not, you mean? Correct. Okay. Uh, well, well, well here, well, here's the thing. Um, even if it doesn't really deter crime, let's just say I grant you that point. Even if it doesn't deter crime, I think in general, if people start to think about um, where they could possibly end up at if they do certain crimes, I think if, if people start to really think about that, I really think it can potentially impact more individuals. Maybe it hasn't gotten to the level to where we've seen this like expanded impact, but I think if it became, I, I, how can I put this? I think if we keep it in place, um, you have enough sensible people out there who will look at it, I guess. Like, you know, sensible people, I would presume like you and me, that would look at that kind of thing and be like, whoa, I don't want to end up in that kind of position. You know what I mean? Yeah, see that that's the thing. It doesn't um it doesn't really factor into whether um somebody decides to commit a crime or not. The ones that land people on death row are usually so heinous that um either somebody is a career criminal or they um you know they sort of have some sort of psychopathy or something like that. And and so the death penalty isn't going to factor into whether or not they commit that crime. Um, it just 
it just doesn't really like 2008 i have statistics 90 94.3 percent of criminologists don't believe that the death penalty has any deterrent um and that's not alone um so like if if the people aren't being deterred i'm, I'm wondering like because you said you would grant that then what what's the practical application of it well to me i would uh i i would just look at it as uh, i mean I, I think there's a lot of things that don't really uh, let, let's just say by the deterrent excuse me i'm sorry by the whole deterrence point um if there's no real strong effect i think um and I, I guess what we what we have to lay out what we mean by deterrence do we mean by mm -hmm. deterrence in like the short term or the deterrence in the long term well either really i mean but by long term what do you mean by long term yeah yeah like if you were to measure like i don't know like the last decade that's been used versus two or three decades or five decades versus i don't know let's say six months or something like that mm -hmm. but, to, but 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 to me i think um it, you'll be hard for, pressed to find uh that the penal system itself i don't know if it's you know necessarily meant to deter crime per se i think the penal system is just for lack of people up who just do stupid stuff even oh, if it doesn't per, society, per, yeah. yeah yeah even if it yeah. doesn't per se deter crime i still think it has a positive effect in just keeping those people out of general society anyway so to me um deterrence is a helpful factor but it would not um you know take me off of um, supporting the penal system, even if it didn't significantly deter crime. I just want bad people to be off the street. Well, but life in prison would do and that I, anyway. I'm sorry? Life imprisonment would do that anyway. They'd be off the street for the rest of their life. Well, yeah, and then you'd have to deal with uh, paying taxes and stuff like that. And I don't know if I like want to pay for a lifetime of taxes for someone who's a vicious murderer. I had kind of well, obje I mean, objections like that and stuff. Well, it's interesting because the death penalty actually costs more than life imprisonment. Again, um, I guess we have to find a way to make it cost effective then. Well, I mean, here's the thing. It's it's so expensive because you have like lots of appeals and, and um, due diligence. They call it extreme due diligence that they basically try to make sure no innocent people are being killed or as much as possible. Um, but, you know, with all of the, the appeals and lawyers and um, procedures that happen, um, that gets very expensive. So, yeah, you can sort of drop the cost, but then you're, you're sort of upping the amount of innocent people that are being killed. And, and I guess my question would be, what is the amount of innocent people being killed that you would accept in order to have a death penalty? Um, well, that's sort of a tough question to answer, but I mean, that's kind of the same question that you can ask for just about any sort of penalty. Like, um, what? how many innocent people would you accept to have like life in prison or something like that? Mm. I mean, you well, can ask that for is... literally any sort of crime. Well, there's a remedy there though. You can release them and compensate them for their time in prison in some way. And we, we do, if we find out someone's uh, been in prison. Assuming... But Assuming you can't you get them out in a reasonable time period, like sure. uh, for someone who's like been there for like four or five decades, which has happened more times than it should be. Um, that's mm -hmm. little to no sort of. Uh, um, how can I put this? Um, it's what, 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. What, 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 what do you, yeah. yeah, that's really but not much. Sure, but you yeah, that's can, not like, that's now. not that's not a consolation to those people. Is like four or five years of their the four or five decades of their lives are gone. You can't they you can't get that back. Their life is basically over. Well, yes and no. We can at least do something to remedy that that injustice that's been committed. 
the problem is that if someone's put to death there's there's nothing we can do to even attempt to remedy that there's that I mean, that's over it's there's nothing that's not necessarily true i mean what? if that person has like an extended what? family or something just like you can get the person in question if they've lost decades of their life compensation if you've killed such a person unjustly you can uh give that like the immediate family compensation assuming that they have yeah, an immediate that's not remedy to the person that's a restitution to the family well it's better than nothing isn't it well yeah or we could just not kill people or well well we could just not lock people up for three four plus decades either well we've got to as you said we've got to remove them from society anyway right we have to remove some people from society or some people we think are damaging to society yeah. Um, what I'm saying is that we've got two options available. The death penalty is more costly. It doesn't deter any crime, so it doesn't give us anything extra than locking up for them for life. Um, why would we go for something without a remedy over something with a remedy to that person, even if it's not sufficient? At least it, it is something. Okay. What remedy are you are you looking at exactly? The, well, the fact that they're can... simply alive. Well, well, I mean, that's that's a that's got to be better than dead, right? But um, um, we 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 can at least release them, which we can't release them from death. Like, so if you get the exact same person, um, and just say you've got sort of you know branching pathways, one one end this innocent person goes to the to the gas chamber or to you know lethal injection, and the other they get locked up for life. And just say in that exact example, two years down the track, we find out, hey, that person was innocent thanks to DNA evidence or something has come up. In one scenario, they're, they're still dead. There's nothing we can do. In the other scenario, we can at least release them and compensate them for two years of, of, of time. So I'm, I'm not sure why we would go for the, the, the lethal injection in that, that case. Well so, well, so what? Because I don't, because I think there are certain things that um like, like like for instance uh if you if if we're looking at something of like a serious nature like murder for instance and mm -hmm. we and we, we we ended up like releasing someone who like didn't commit a murder you know mm -hmm. if we end up like releasing someone who did not commit a murder then yeah. what are we going to do in place of that? Are we just going to like take the person who did commit mm -hmm. the murder and just actually lock them up? Yeah. Okay. So if, if you just like put that person in there, then do you think mm -hmm. just locking them up is like going to be consistent with the crime? Cause they still get to live the person that they killed. Don't get to come back. Yeah, um, that's that's a fair point. You know that that we're not we're not um, sort of um, doing an eye for an eye kind of thing. But the the problem with an eye for an eye is everybody ends up blind. Um, you 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 can't um, look at a, a just society and say, hey, we're going to do the exact same thing that they did as a punishment, or else you know you have a a, a you know you you would have to go around burning alive arsonists that have done that or you know uh, you know I, i'm sure you wouldn't advocate for for you know raping a rapist as a punishment kind of thing you know so there's there's some things that our justice system has to be better than and and sort of say hey here's the punishment it's not going to be exactly what the crime you committed is because you know i mean if somebody steals something do we just take something of theirs away and let them go no of course not I mean that's that's a weird kind of argument to make that that it should be sort of an eye for an eye punishment. Well, I think stealing something um and stealing something back is like wrong for wrong. Stealing them right. and locking them up is right for right. Stealing them and locking them up is right for right, not stealing and stealing. I would agree. Sure. I mean, yeah, I mean like in, yeah, like in the case agree. of in the case of the capital punishment, it's not yeah. like uh someone's being killed and or rather someone's being murdered and they're returning murder they're returning justice 
I mean, well, that's the way I see it anyway, given my worldview. I don't think you can call like 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 for instance, uh yeah. if um you were if 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 you were like living in the time to where let's just say that they call it Hitler himself, and it was quite clear that the dude was behind massive amounts of untold murders, I think mm-hmm. it would be very just to kill this dude. Not to just let this dude languish and exist. Because he needs what, to pay for the lives just? that he take. What, why would that be I'm just? Sorry? Why would that be just? Why would that be just? Because mm. I think um, life is sacred. And the way I see it is life is a sacred thing. And when you rob someone else of that, I don't think you get the, the right to embody that existence, even if it's for a short time, even if it's in solitary confinement, I just don't think you get the right to embody something that you snuffed away from somebody else. Well, it sounds like what you're describing is is sort of a vengeance or or, or a, a punitive kind of um, yeah, idea. in a sense it is, yeah. Well, vengeance isn't justice, you know, that, that isn't what it is. And this sort of goes into the eye for an eye kind of thing. Um, justice is, is different than vengeance. Well, um, justice by what standard? Well, by, by the standard of, of sort of secular law and, and sort of our moral responsibility. Um, because sort of that, that's why we don't just, you know, beat beat somebody who's committed assault, right? We don't just lay into them with, with you know, um, um, rods and stuff because we want to punish them or have some kind of vengeance against them. Um, we, don't, we don't torture a torturer because that level of brutality demeans all of us as a society. It brings us down to a society that will torture people and that's not a good thing for our society. Um, I think that that. Um, um, Let me ask you a quick question. Yeah, uh, yeah, well, sure. Complete, complete your thought, and then I'll ask you a question after. Oh well, I, I think it was uh, C- uh, Cesar Beccaria, um, sort of on a treatise of crimes and punishment, says that the death penalty can't be useful because it gives barbarity to your state. Um, we should never encourage any state to think that that they can take human life, um, and and sort of mm-hmm. because it doesn't offer any benefit to society. Um, I, I, I sort of put forth, well, shouldn't we do what you know sort of boosts society rather than what demeans it? Sure. Uh, so let me just ask you a quick question: if there was somebody who kidnapped a person and they kept them in captivity for quite some time. Let's say that this person was in captivity for like five years and this person mm-hmm. escapes from their captivity of being kidnapped, manages yep. to seek the authorities and the person who ki- got kidnapped got caught. Would it be mm-hmm. vengeance to put that person behind bars for five years or more because they have this person behind in captivity for five years, would you consider that vengeance? Uh, well, I mean, it depends on why you're doing it. If you're doing it just to punish the person in a kind of punitive state, but that's generally not why we're locking people up. We're locking people up to remove them because they're doing harm to society. Um, so um, e- even if you decided to lock them up, if it was particularly egregious and you decided to lock them up for 20 years, um, I think that is is just, but it's because we're we're trying to provide justice for society and not just punish somebody outright. Well, that's what I'm saying. It seems like uh, I'm really trying to tease out what you mean by vengeance and how do you demarcate exactly where that is? Because it seems like you're saying if somebody uh, kills somebody and then you put them to death, you can call that vengeance. But if someone kidnaps right. somebody and you lock them up taking away their freedom, then that's not vengeance. It seems like both are consistent. One one person kept someone in captivity, you lose mm-hmm. your freedom, now you're in captivity, you're behind bars. Uh, that's not the reason why and, we're doing it. Well, well, I mean, if you talk about the death penalty, uh, I think it's 
a form of vengeance, but then again, I don't think vengeance is necessarily unjust. I think you're coming from the standpoint that vengeance is unjust necessarily, which I would disagree with. Well, I mean, it's it's um, the the whole idea and what our modern idea of justice is is that um, justice is is the application of the law in society in a way that's completely impartial and free from anything but um, fair, reasonable interpretation of the law. So, um, this whole idea that we should punish people based upon our feelings of what they've done. Um, I don't see that as justice, and that's what the difference between justice and vengeance would be. Vengeance is coloured by how we um, interpreted their actions against our own sense of morality, um, and and that's how we'd differentiate it in in a modern sense. Um, but you know, I I, I don't I, I sort of so you you know the so, the whole thing of the okay. the justice woman. She's got the the scales and her face is blind she doesn't see mm -hmm. it, here's the thing because i come from a christian worldview similar to that gentleman that you were speaking with them um i think his name was matt gruber i think mcgruber yeah. yeah yeah i come from a similar worldview which says that vengeance is my set the lord so uh god is a just god but he's also a vengeful god as well so that's the sort of framework I'm coming from. I guess that's where our disagreement is going to lie. I don't see a vengeful okay. act as necessarily as unjust. Um, but it seems kind of subjective how you really tease out what is vengeance and what is justice because you're saying that um, it's sort of like uh, neutral, if you will, which I don't really know if that's entirely true. How could you have something that's entirely neutral? In my view, neutrality doesn't truly exist in that sense because neutrality is going to come down to a set of beliefs which, which is going to be predicated in the framework that you hold to, which is going to be connected to your worldview system. That's not going to be neutral in any way, shape, or form. Well, I, I, I sort of, I think that's the, the goal. I, I'm, I'm not sure how much I could argue that that's actually implemented with you know, complete neutrality. I think I'd agree with you that that you know, sort of, um, there is is um, some kind. Of, everybody has biases, and I, I understand that. Um, but um, the the whole idea is that we at least try to to take out our biases out of the punishments that we hand down to people. And I think that sort of um, inflicting harm on others in order to uh, for society to feel better about something that's happened isn't as as useful as implementing a punishment in order to you sort of in a utility way remove a harm from society and then um i i think that that's a way better way to to go about it and i mean if i could just sort of appeal to your your biblical sense i mean I, I believe that forgiveness is supposed to be a big part of Christian doctrine. Yes, it is. And the thing about forgiveness is that um, we, as people who operate in terms of our everyday day-to-day uh, -day living, we are not mm. to go around just indiscriminately just um, exacting justice into our hands. It's, the role of us as creatures to be forgiving. It's the role of God to exact the vengeance. So he would be the ultimate authoritative element for vengeance while we're the ones who are the forgiving entities in, in the equation. Well, so why can't we just lock them up? See, I, I still don't get why we need to kill people necessarily. I, you know, I, I, I don't, understand what it gets us about like because you know i mean yeah we've we forgive forgiving is good um but um you know obviously we can't go around and forgive everything that everybody does or else the society would fall apart um but i don't understand sort of what position you're giving me that gives us anything more than locking well, people up for the well, death really, we're, apart we're, from... well really think about the think about the failures of 
the penal system as it is. I mean, a lot of, unfortunately and sadly, a lot of innocent people get locked up, but also on the other side of that coin, you get people who actually done crimes who get out continuously over and over again and look at somebody who may be a clear cut. There's no question about it. this person's a murderer, but they just happen to have like the most expert and best legal team of all time. And they keep getting out right. over and over again. And then what do you do about something like that? If this person is allowed to even like languish at all, you may have some um, judge somewhere. You may have some uh, disposition come out of nowhere. It, 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 a whole lot of stuff can happen. Even for the cases that are quote unquote without the possibility of parole, you can always have some loophole or some challenge come out of nowhere that calls somebody sure. to look at something again. And then, you know, somebody who's supposed to be in there for life are gonna, is going to be walking out smelling like a rose, you know? So you got situations like this that can also happen too, even with the worst of criminals. So uh, that's exacerbated it, by the death penalty, not not because the death penalty, the chances whether you end up on death row is largely to do with how much money you have. Well, guess what? If if somebody has like the best legal team and you you don't have a death penalty on the table, then guess what? If we know for a fact that this person's a murderer and they just have a really expert legal team that can basically get them out of anything, then there's there's <laughs> As long as they're walking around, there you go. There's no justice there. But if you were to just put them, if you were if you were just to put them to death, they would have no possibility of even that happening. But but yeah, but like the the the, the death penalty is sentence, not a conviction. So um, you, you would be found guilty or not guilty before you even discuss the death penalty. So true. true. I agree um, with that. The only way. You could you could sort of ensure that that doesn't happen is to change the legal system that so in such a way that you wouldn't you know you wouldn't have as much representation or you couldn't spend as much on a lawyer or something like that. But what I'm getting at is that that doesn't necessitate the death penalty. It just means changing the legal system. Like you could still do that and have lifetime imprisonment and solve that problem. Um, well, how many changes of the legal system are you going to have are you, or are you going to implement? It doesn't really matter how much you try to, quote unquote, change the legal system. The people with the best legal team are going to find ways around that. I mean, I think we've done made a lot of changes to the legal system over the years and a lot of injustice still happens nonetheless. I think we've made yeah. a lot of uh, changes over the years to try to um limit the injustices towards blacks that happen but yet we still have a lot of injustice that happens so i mean well, you can make all the changes you yeah. want but if you got somebody who knows the law and who can uh act in certain ways behind the scenes and whatnot pay off certain people it doesn't really matter how much you patch stuff up people who are intending on Finding ways to cheat the system will cheat the system no matter what. Uh, yeah, yeah, but but you know that's that's a different different thing of sentencing. Um, you know, I I, I I I'm not sure why that would would sort of alter how they're they're sentenced. So they they've either found guilty or not guilty, and yeah, you're sort of saying, hey, there's people with that can afford more money, and I agree. It, it's sort of Dependent on how much money you've got, as you said, African Americans are, you know, black people are absolutely um, convicted more than they should, and in fact, you know, sort of black people on death row are probably um, vastly overrepresented as well. Um, but that's in the conviction stages; that's not sentencing. So, what what I'm saying is that you don't change the the legal system; you've you've got the same problem, except they're they're you know lots of black people are going to the um um death penalty rather than to life imprisonment you know that that haven't done anything wrong because that's what the system is like and i'll get some statistics for you um my i guess my concern is do you yeah do you want to 
Sorry, uh, sorry to interrupt, Tom Locke. I'll just I'll just sort of say that thirteen percent of the population, thirteen point six percent of the population is black in America, and they represent forty one percent of the death penalty population. I guess my concern is, uh, do you want to live in a world to where you got people who commit uh, vicious crimes, who mm -hmm. get the, who get the benefit? of being able to live off you know hard-working individuals who get the benefit of being able to just exist at all do you want to live in a world to where people who have done yes. these sorts of things i'm sorry yes yeah i'd rather live in a world where um somebody that did an atrocious crime didn't die than have a person that did absolutely nothing wrong um be, be killed in such a such a horrible manner yeah okay so so my so my thing is this um if 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 you if you just want this person to live so much then why not try to fight for putting this person in consolatory confinement then why not do that so I mean that that is something you can do if they're they're a danger in prison. Sure, um, I think though that that more and more we're looking at prison like rehabilitative, and I know that you know somebody that you're describing has very low chance of being rehabilitated. In fact, probably almost no chance of being rehabilitated. But I would rather have them in prison and sort of you know have to spend their time in prison where they can't hurt anybody or the people that they hurt. Are, people that have all, or also been convicted of a crime, if they are killing people in prison, yeah, solitary is probably the best for them. But um, I would rather that than have, you know, my neighbour who did nothing wrong, um, incorrectly convicted and, and sentenced to death. I think that um, I'd be a lot happier in society knowing that, hey, if someone's incorrectly convicted, they're, they're going to go to, um, you know, in prison, sure, but they're not going to be killed by the state um, because sort of the way that they kill them is, is quite horrible. Okay. So why, why, what would, what would be the issue? Let's, let's just say that they were a mass murderer and they get behind no. bars, but mm -hmm. they essentially mind their own business. What would be the issue of just putting them in solitary confinement for the rest of their lives? What would be the issue with that? Um, I, I don't think I would have so much of an issue with that, except that sort of solitary, you need to have guards bring them food. It takes a little bit more, um, you know, um, space and uh, facilities than your average cell and sort of, you know, prison population. I think it would be a utility argument rather than any kind of moral argument. Um, I think it might be necessary to put some of these people in, in sort of solitary confinement kind of thing. I think that might be entirely necessary. Well, then, but it, then I suppose uh, we can make, we, we can just, you know, restructure a whole lot of prisons and make a whole lot of ones with solitary confinement then, right? But then you have people that will come out and try to make cases, maybe not you necessarily, but your people have come out and making cases for psychological and mental torture and whatnot. And then we'd have to deal with that mess. Well, I, I, I mean that that would certainly be an issue. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, you'd have to in some way, um, you know, make sure they're not being. I mean, it, it's not really that nice to be driven crazy in in prison. It's not really that useful to society. Um, I think it's more my argument would be, well, why why bother if we can just put them in a prison population? You know, like why why would we spend that extra resources on a person that isn't worth spending it on? So um, we would put them in the general prison population, and we're just only and I was just talking about the person that wouldn't do anything, but the vast majority yeah. of these people or very, very violent individuals. And sure. if you mix them along with the people who were convicted wrongly and whatnot, you'll serve the possibility of getting those people caught in the crossfire of like violent interactions with these people. Sure.
but that's you know. So if you just keep them in the, if you keep them in the, if you keep them in the general population, then you really haven't really accomplished much because you say, well, uh, you 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 don't want you don't want to, you know, institute the death penalty. But it seems like what you're talking about is going to get a lot of those innocent people caught in the crossfire just as much. It's not going to be a real solution for those people. Well, I mean, you're talking about probabilities here, and the death penalty sort of you have a hundred percent chance of dying. If if you if you're put in the prison population, you have you know like a five percent chance of dying or even higher. It's got to be better than a hundred percent chance of being killed. Plus, the death penalty is more expensive and and sort of you know is is pretty horrible at the same time. So I, I don't think that's a good argument that hey, there's a there's a possibility of somebody who's incorrectly um uh convicted of being killed when sort of that probability is a hundred percent on on you know when when you're on the death penalty well that's well that's that would be the utility of these um because it, in my mind if you're going to take away the death penalty i think these solitary confinement facilities will be the next best thing because uh you don't want to get you don't even want to get these people caught up in the middle of violent people like this like if, oh, if somebody sure. yeah. like went if somebody went to jail for like tax evasion and they're sitting next to the dude who went to jail for like um mass murder, I think that's mm. two people you don't want aligned in the same dang cell. Well, sure. Yeah, but 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 you're sort of talking about um yeah, I no, I, I get you. It's just yeah, I, I I don't see the extra utility of of sort of I mean, yeah, we could put them in solitary confinement, but again, you're, you're talking about taxes and, and things like that. You would, you would have to sort of bear the brunt of the cost of that, um, which, you know, would probably be a lot higher than just having a general population. Um, uh, well, I, I, I'm, just, I, I'm just talking about, like, what would be a better... Because if we're going to take the death penalty off the table, then... You, you're going to have to offer a better solution. And to me, uh, potentially putting people like, like, let's say you or I, because I would assume that you, you or myself. I mean, I know I'm not a violent person, but I would assume that you're probably not a very violent person. And no. if, if, if something unfortunate was to happen in your life to where you unjustly got locked in jail, I don't think you'd want to have your life possibly put at risk with a bunch of violent people around you. I don't think you would even want to uh, deal with that kind of a reality from day to day, would you? Well, no, I wouldn't want to, but what I'm saying is that the, you know, if, it, if it's a choice between going into a prison population and being killed on death row, I'll take the prison population. Well, uh, <laughs> be killed... Because you talk about sentencing uh, versus conviction, at least in right. the terms in, in terms of uh, uh, what can happen to you on death row, those things take mm -hmm. years, as you pointed out earlier. That can take a long dang time, but you never know when you're going to get uh, like severely harmed and or killed with dealing with people right. in the prison population. That can happen your first day in there. Sure. But I'd rather that than sort of That's, being on death row. So you you would rather uh, deal with having your life at rest daily with violent people near you in the general population versus 15, 20 years on death row. Yeah. Yeah, so the U.S. prison I population... Guess that, I guess that you and I just disagree with that because I, I think the probability of you possibly being shanked or killed is very very high when you're dealing with violent criminals like that um i don't think so i mean federal prisoners the prison population is one thousand two uh, one million two hundred and four thousand which is horrific at 2021 um the federal deaths in custody for the same year was um 614 deaths in custody well, it depends on how they structure those prisons, though. Oh, perhaps, yeah. I mean, is it would would, would that be would, would even would that number be acceptable for you, or would that be too high a number? 
Um, well, I, I don't think any number's acceptable for me. I think we should minimize that as much as possible, but there is a practicality of removing people that are, you know, sort of dangerous to others from society. So that that has to be weighed up. It's just I, I don't know what else a, a, a death penalty um, sort of gets you um, because... Um, you know, okay, so there's a chance that you might be harmed. Like, like when you look at the the you know sort of death row and talk to the prisoners on there, all of them want to go back into max maximum security. Like, there's none that want to stay on on death row. And maybe you would see it as. And here, I'll, I'll at least concede this, Tonlock. Yeah, if, but you said you... it wasn't a deterrent, though. I mean, if they don't want to go on death row, that seems like it would be pretty heavy deterrent to me. <laughs> Well, not to the people who haven't committed the crime yet. Like, if you're thinking about going and robbing a bank and, you know, the guy's high off his mind and whatever, he, he's not thinking about the death penalty. It's just not deterring that person. But people that are on death row would rather be alive and in a population of prisoners than on death row. Um, but I will concede to you, definitely concede, that if someone says, hey, I, I can't handle... Um, um, sort of life in prison, um, I would rather have the death penalty, that would be a completely different conversation, like if they're consenting to it. Yeah, you brought this point about rehabilitation, and I think that was a very interesting point. So um, do you think do you think any criminal, not any person necessarily, but any kind of criminal, like any kind of category of criminal can be rehabilitated. Like, uh, yeah. for instance, like, uh, like ta uh, someone could be re rehabilitated if they have committed tax evasion, or someone could be rehabilitated if they're just a psychopathic mass murderer. You, you think literally any category, uh, a person could be really be rehabilitated, right? Yeah, I think that I think that rehabilitation is definitely something that that can happen. Um, I think that some people are beyond re rehabilitation, but we won't know that until we actually try. And what would take in your mind to rehabilitate these people? Uh, what do you mean, sorry? Yeah, because rehabilitation is going to require very concrete steps. It's going to require a certain level of psychological um shifting of things and it's going to require uh certain steps being taken like yeah sure like um getting people to think differently about things and what do you do to get a mass murderer to think drastically different and i mean so different that he doesn't even want to go back to thinking the way he did before such that he gets rehabilitated how do you rehabilitate somebody like that um, well, slowly with with psychological treatment, um, sort of. So, what what we're talking about is psychological states and behavioural therapy, um, looking at how we change um, what it is that's sort of broken inside these people. Um, but it, it can be different for all kinds of different people. Some people are basically rehabilitated by the time time they step in there. Like some people will go to prison and they'll never, ever go back. Like, they just do not want to go back and they'll be a law-abiding citizen for the rest of their lives. So it depends on what got them there in the first place and the sort of mental state that they are in. Um, you know, that, that's a very, very highly sort of specific question to an individual. And, and again, I, I will certainly concede that there are some people that just cannot be rehabilitated. Okay, let's, but let's really think about this. Because you said... Any category this can be applied to, like, what would you do to rehabilitate someone like a Jeffrey Dahmer? Like, how would you rehabilitate someone like that? You said, you, and you did concede, to be fair, that some people can't be rehabilitated. Yeah. But you would have to uh, presuppose that this person is not even a Jeffrey Dahmer at all. If you're talking about rehabilitation, then... Mm -hmm. That would already presuppose that that person is oriented towards rehabilitation anyway. Uh, that's not necessarily true. That's not necessarily true. Um, well, it's just... 
So, well, hold, hold on. If that person's not already oriented towards rehabilitation, then you would have yeah. to drastically somehow find a way to adjust uh, to reverse their psychology in a 180 fashion. Right. And right. For, for such so, a person, and that's what I'm saying, for yeah. such a person, what would you have to do? Would you have to well, torture would, them? Would you have to put them in no, solitary confinement? No. Would, would you have no. to strike the fear of God like, into them? What would you have so, to do? No, Tom, look, violence against somebody doesn't get them to stop being violent. That's that's not how that works. Like, you don't you don't minimize violence by being violent towards somebody. That that will never work in the long run. You're just you're just gonna well, you just you just bake them you just bake them cookies and invite them to a cookout. Like, what do you no. want to do to rehabilitate no. these people, sir? Yeah, so basically you have psychological therapies like um, cognitive behavioral therapy. You have a, a number of um, therapies. You, you, you have uh, things like uh, education programs. You have things like uh, positive reinforcement by job opportunity. You have a lot of different programs that all work together to show them they can be a productive member of society and the benefit of being a productive member of society, along with the change of their mental state to... Because they, these kind of criminals, they're, they're not, they're a not. A lot of this stuff they that, already knew. A lot of this stuff they already knew before they got in no, there. No. You're not really, you're not really. I said a lot of it, not necessarily all of it, but I say a lot mm. of the essential stuff they already knew before they got in there. Well, not necessarily. I don't. I don't think many criminals are. Well, aware I mean, of the what, what, of what, cognitive what, behavioral therapy. What, what significant thing are they introducing are you introducing to these people like you, you like you say job opportunities for instance like they didn't know about the no. fact that jobs exist they didn't know about that stuff before no but they may feel let down by um society in where they can get jobs how they can get jobs the the uh benefit that they are, are, can actually bring to society um, if you ever saw um a, a gordon ramsay thing you went in to teach prisoners how to cook right? Just how to cook, like how to bake cookies and bake things, be cake makers. Um, and it was very successful in the way that they felt more productive and, and a better member of society. Um, these are people that, that you know, sort to, of don't, you know, obviously me, they weren't murderers. But... Those people, again, it seems like you're talking about people that are generally already oriented towards that kind of thing. I don't know how you find someone um, who is... Yeah really not oriented period and you somehow managed to reverse them into being oriented that's what i'm talking about well that would to be me, the, um to me the only way the... you can really do that is you have to have something seriously drastic just you know talking about a job opportunity here and there is probably not going to drastically change the mindset of a mass murderer you've never been to therapy have you I'm sorry. Have I? You've never been, been to therapy. therapy. Yeah. N no, but you know, I, okay. I've never been raped either. I think I think it's. I no, no, know no. That. That's it's fine. I'm. I'm not. I'm not hassling you, Tom. You can, I think some things you can know without having to have experienced them. I think some things are just common sense. Okay, maybe. Um, well, my experience of therapy is that it was it was um, it, it it alters your mind significantly. It can have a massive, massive impact on you. I think you're really minimizing the effect of some of these these things that psychologists do. And I'm not saying that everybody is going to suddenly turn around. I did acknowledge very early that some people aren't able to be rehabilitated at all. Like they will never get into that mindset of, you know, how do I go on with my life from here? But the reason why we have parole boards is because people do get to that mindset and they do, you know, they are rehabilitated. Okay. Again, like, like rehab means that somebody has their mindset renewed and they are changing the way they think about things. But like somebody who's rehabilitating from drugs, for instance. I like yes. to think the person who's rehabilitating from drugs is already oriented towards that goal anyway because they find something that motivates them to that very end. 
they they seem yes. to be already oriented towards that. It's, because here's the thing. Not necessarily. Uh, well, I mean, the, the way it, that they, it, they get orientated towards it is a number of different ways. I mean, there might be an intervention by their friends and they might say, hey, this is how you affect everybody. Um, there might be they might talk to um, a psychologist about other problems in their life. Why do I feel so sad? Why do I feel well, useless? Why do I feel like this? Well, then, and you, then just they might be... you, you just breach deep and then you just hit on something that was already there and you just brought it out of them. That well, was the already there. But that's what I'm saying. They were already, they were already toward, they were already oriented towards that. You just managed to hit the right switch that was already there in the first place. Well, it might not be a, a therapist they're talking to. They might just say to a friend, "Hey, uh, you know, I, I, I feel this way or I feel that way." Um, if if somebody is like, "No, I, I absolutely love my lifestyle on this substance, and I will not change ever. I will die, you know, doing whatever substance that I'm on." Then yeah, that's somebody who who can't be rehabilitated because you have to sort of at least acknowledge that that there's something better if you change behaviour in order to start the process. I grant you that, but that doesn't mean that the death penalty is in any way a better a better solution for those people. Well, because because I don't even buy, I don't even completely buy this whole idea about rehabilitation because I think a uh, prison. It's primarily meant to just put away bad people. Like, would it get? I mean, we would hope for rehabilitation, but if you're looking for this goal of rehabilitation, I really think you're going to be um, doing things to set yourself up real, real short. Because um, how many of these people have been quote unquote rehabilitated just to walk out of prisons doing the same stuff they did before? I can't tell you how many uh, stories I've seen. I can't tell you how many stories I've seen to where people were supposedly rehabilitated and they went out and did the same crap that they did before they got locked that got them locked up. Um, so I think prison is mainly I'm sorry. Forty four percent. But um and so what, 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 and, 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 what, and, and for those, and for that percentage, what what kind of crimes are we dealing with here? What are we talking about? uh all kinds of crimes i mean i don't have that to hand um but recidivism in the us is extraordinarily high um it's 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 much less recidivism is much less in countries like norway and sweden and finland that actually focus on rehabilitation rather than just punitive sort of punishment kind of thing that's the thing. The countries that focus on rehabilitation rather than just, as you say, locking them up, their recidivation, uh, uh, recidivism rate is, or their reoffending rate is a lot less high. And to me, it's not merely uh, about justice or justice or injustice just for the person themselves. It's also about for the people that they impact as well. That's another reason why I would support the death penalty because um, okay. if like a murderer is murdering people and they impact the lives of other people, I think that would bring them a lot of closure to put that person to death and um, just knowing that that person isn't breathing air, you know? I think that's another thing that can um, that can also uh favor for the death penalty argument it's about the impact it has on other people's lives and i think if you're looking at the fact that these death penalty things do take years and years perhaps these people can have a certain amount of time to voice their grievances and let this person know about the damage that they've done and then you know, before the end of that, have that person seriously chew on that. Maybe they won't chew on it. Maybe they'll be just as hardened as ever. But, you know, maybe they'll chew on that. And then at the end of it all, they meet their ultimate penalty. I think that's a lot. That, uh, that's a lot for a person to deal with, even if it doesn't have this huge deterrence, um, you know, on this grand scale. I still think on a moral level, it brings a lot of families closure. And I think uh, that that's a big deal. 
if you're dealing with people like, let's say, Osama bin Laden or Saddam Hussein back in the day, these people, mm. you know, murdered untold amounts of people. And I don't think a lot of people are at rest and have that kind of closure within themselves if you just let these people languish all day long. And especially when you, when you have a corrupt system of, of not only um, people who run these who, who, politicians and whatnot, who are behind the running of these legal systems, but you have also international corruption as well. If you are, if these people are literally living and they have a chance to get out, I think that's going to put a lot of people, you know, in, in, a, in, in a state of unease and in a state of anger at the fact that, look, these people are mass murderers and we're letting these people live. We're letting these people potentially get connected to certain corrupt individuals because all you have to do is have the right person say the word and these people are walking around free again. That's all. Well, I think, I think that's a sort of oversimplification of the, the sort of paroling process. I, I get I, what you're saying, I, I, it's not, I, I get, it's not yeah, I don't, but, I don't want to, yeah. you know, put it. Yeah, you're right. It is sort of an oversimplification. But I'm, I'm just saying, we, we're dealing with uh, corrupt politicians, and you're dealing with uh, corrupt people who run these systems and whatnot. That's the sort of stuff that, you, that you're going to deal with. Well, uh, it's sort of you covered a lot there, but, Tonlock. Like, um, in regard to about, well, just, just let me say something because you've covered. I'm, I'm sorry. A lot go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, go you, ahead. you've covered a lot of topics. So, um, a Minnesota research said that only two point five percent of people, uh, you know, that that co victims, so people that that their family had been killed or whatever, achieved closure um, when when they got the death penalty. So, very very few people actually feel good. Um, I don't even know how you would even measure that, to be honest, bro. Well, you ask I, people, you do surveys of, of large quantities of people. That's what statistics is. You do surveys to people. Um, and and 20% said that the execution did not help them heal. Um, so that, that sort of leaves a large percentage, over 70% of people it, that said that they they expressed feelings of emptiness, that the, the death penalty didn't bring them back. Okay, um, so... Sort of Hold on a second. See where, where that, well, you covered a lot, Tom Lock, and I really have to go go through all of it because you covered a lot of topics in there. Um, and and sort of so the idea is that we like the idea that we base our punishments upon how the victims feel is antithetical to our modern idea of justice. Because should we um beat somebody to death with um whips, you know, scour them if that's what the victim feels will bring them justice? Or should we um, put somebody, you know, cover them in honey and leave them on an anthill if that's what the victims feel will bring them justice? I just I just don't see a path where we, we you know, do punishments based upon what the victims feel like rather than application of the law. That's not exactly what I'm saying, though. I think that's an oversimplification of my point right there. If you want to talk about oversimplifications. Okay, so what? why then would we do what the, you know, just make the victims feel better? I mean, isn't that what you're saying, that, that it would make the victims feel better? No, because we're, we're thinking, like, what, what, what exactly is justice? And I think, well, how they would feel is kind of like a... More, more, more of a byproduct. But I think there's something to be said there that if something is actually stipulated to be unjust, you there, there is gonna be that lack of closure there because um, it, it, it'll, it'll be like if a mass murderer uh, ended up getting like two years behind bars because of like a like a corrupt system or whatever. There's going to be a whole lot of people pissed off because that's like legitimately unjust in my mind. Wouldn't you agree? Well, yeah, but um, that that's certainly unjust. But isn't isn't sort of a, a, an in, innocent person getting the death penalty incredibly unjust as well? Well, yeah, but so is locking someone up for 50 years well, that sure. didn't do anything. That's also unjust. 
And I don't think oh, none of these things, just... none of these things are de are deterrent. None, none, none of these things are arguments right. against the institutions of locking people up, or in my mind, the death penalty itself too. Well, it just sounds like your arguments sort of saying, "Hey, um, the the system's corrupt," but the the death penalty, like, so if you've got a corrupt system that sort of um, lets people go, you know, you can say, "Hey, there's a corrupt system that lets people go under the death penalty." Your arguments don't seem to be for the death penalty, rather than just the way the justice system operates in general. Oh, 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 oh! It, oh, it is. Oh, it is. Right. Um, I yeah. mean, it, it, it's going to have it's going to have certain overlap, but I think in many cases okay. the death penalty uh, potentially, you know gets around all of that type of stuff. I, I don't think it does. I, I don't see how if a system's corrupt, um, that the death penalty will make it not corrupt. I, explain to me how well, that it works. Don't, it, don't, it don't make it not corrupt, but guess what? If, you, it, if somebody was, let's say, killed instead of just languishing behind bars, they have, and, and they were like an actual murderer, and they have no chance right. of like playing the system even further. If they were just actually killed, then they have no opportunity to play the system even more, to kill even more people. That's what I'm saying. But you've got to you've got to weigh that up with sort of you know if that's the system and they're killed, then they've got no way to like if they were innocent, then they've got no way to sort of get themselves out of that situation. They're just killed. Um, so you know if you wanna if you wanna sort of go to to hypotheticals and things then um that that would be the case as well well here well that's that's uh, that's why i think we gotta really take our time with these things to really consider everything very very carefully before we get innocent people locked up and that applies to both sides whether it's sure. long-term imprisonment or death yeah absolutely i agree with you on that you know we, we have to have a system that doesn't lock people up that are innocent i, I completely agree um but i think it's a, a lesser evil to lock somebody up than to put them to death uh, because as i said earlier i mean we're sort of going back over the same points um that that you know you can at least let them go if they're locked up and you find out they're innocent which you can't do with the death penalty well explain ex explain to me why um if if you we're dealing if you're if you were dealing with the same person, like a mass murderer, and he came onto your doorstep, if it was a self-defense situation and mm -hmm. you had the opportunity to defend yourself and you needed to kill this person to and take this person out completely, that would be completely unjust that would be completely justified. But presumably yes, yes. for for the penals for the penal system for the penal system to take over. And for them to put that person to death is unjustified. Explain that to me. That's correct. Yeah, so um, I think that it's because that person is no longer a threat. So self-defense is only in cases where a, a life is threatened kind of thing. You can show that your life is threatened. If it's found that, you know, the, the person that was on your doorstep had surrendered, um, lay down on the ground and was surrendering to you, and you clubbed them in the back of the head with a baseball bat and killed them, you would be up for murder. Okay, so I understand what you're saying right there. You know, current threat versus not an active threat but still right. but you still but, but still you're dealing with the fact that you're saying um the the authoritative elements over us don't have the right to decide life and death but they have the right to decide um situations that are under life and death in terms of sentencing well, and what that's not really my argument i'm just saying it's not a good idea to allow them to be able to kill prisoners, like sort of um, like a corrupt system that you're talking about. Just wow. say um, that that they're they're um, putting a lot of black people in prison by charging them with sort of crimes that are you know sort of specific to black people kind of thing. Just say I don't know whether that's even a hypothetical or not, but anyway, let's just go with that. Um, if that is a corrupt government then they actually have the power to kill those people that they deem to be able to you know, want to kill. 
Um, what I'm proposing is that once they're in custody and no longer a threat, the government is treated like just like any other citizen. They can't kill somebody who's not a threat to them. So a police officer can shoot somebody that has a gun in their hand and pointing at the police officer. But what they can't do is just go out and kill somebody who's already in custody and is not a threat to them. I mean, you can sort of say the hypothetical, well, oh, what if they, you know, get out and become a threat again? But that's like saying in that self-defense thing that what if they, you know, get up and attack me? We don't accept what ifs as far as like self-defense yeah, and imminent yeah, threat is concerned. Look, look, if we're dealing with the governor authority and you're saying take yeah. self-defense off the table, are you not saying that? I'm not, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. I'm oh, not okay. saying so, it's off the table. What I'm saying is that no, executing no, 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 people. I'm not, I'm not saying. I'm not, not. That's not why. That's not what I was getting at. I'm not saying take self defense off the table. I'm talking about the death penalty specifically. Right. If you're talking about the okay. governing authority in the context of the death penalty, are you saying that the governing authority does not have the right to decide life and death? What do you mean by does not have the right to decide life and death? Right, well, because you're you saying that, that it is it is wrong for the governing authority to determine who gets to live and die because of the possibility of innocent people being called in the crossfire. Therefore, at least for one um, sort of facet of that, you don't think, maybe there's other arguments that you can give to support such a view, but for at least that, you think it would be wrong for the governing authority to decide life and death. Well, I don't think the governing authority should be able to determine which people should live or die. I don't think that's good for a government to be able to do to its own citizens. But, but the um, government I think it's the very... authority has the right to decide other things which have nothing to do with death. Um, well, I think I think they're given power by people to determine certain things, yeah. I think that that is, that is entirely um, warranted. But sort of so we have protections in place that they don't get to decide. For instance, um, you know, they can't... Um, decide, uh, you know, things against the Constitution and stuff. They can't decide that you don't have the right to free speech. They don't decide that you you don't have the the right to um, sort of, you know, imprisonment without a fair trial and things like that. Um, we, we narrow the scope of the power of the government and make them dependent on a mandate from the masses in order to do these things. But I, I don't think it's helpful nor constructive for a society whenever a government decides to or, or has the power to kill any citizens i think that oh, yeah. sort of um you know I, I think that i would like to see that in a constitution you so know no I'm, government has the right to take the lives of their citizens i'd love to see that enshrined so i'm not yeah i'm not talking about other people like society i'm saying you specifically do not right. believe that government has the right to decide life and death correct yes uh well by life and death um i, I think Look, i think you know death sort of... itself, just the death penalty itself. i'm not talking about life in some sort of abstract sense like well uh if they're being yeah, if you, like the yeah, prison yeah, yeah. Man, the junk food versus the gourmet right, right. food and you need to talk about quality of life that's not what i mean i'm talking about like what did they get to exist period versus die they don't have the right to yes. decide that you in your view i i don't think so no i don't think they have the right to decide that no and is there one concrete reason you can give me why you think they don't have the right to, to, to uh, decide that um because nobody in society including a government um should have to have the right to infringe on another's bodily autonomy unless they have broken the law. Oh, so really the whole death penalty argument for you comes down to bodily autonomy? Is that what we're really looking at here? Well, yeah, that's the, the basis in law for why, why you know, you can't go out and, you know, I can't harm you, Tom Locke, because, you know, you have bodily autonomy. So I can't just go up and, you know, do whatever to you that I want because you have that right. That's the basis in law. Um, so it's a very important point that you have to have bodily autonomy or else, you know, what are we talking about here? Well, when you say bodily autonomy, um, yeah. do you think that's within certain reasonable limits or is that unlimited? 
Um, I mean, it, it depends on on the situation, but yeah, it, it it's simply like you have the right to, you know, I mean, if you're talking about that self defense again, then yeah, violation of of my bodily autonomy, or at least a reasonable um sort of expectation of such, um, would allow me to, you know, violate it in turn in order to protect myself, and that that's okay. Um, but um okay. I, I still don't think you know sort of so if you're talking about minimal crimes like somebody spits on me that's still a violation of my bodily autonomy okay so if someone violates someone else's bodily autonomy by killing them you don't think the remedy to that violation is death not unless it's but necessary but, but presumably if they were to kidnap somebody for a certain amount of time, the remedy for them would be to lose their freedom for a certain amount of time. Well, it, it depends on on what happens. Um, um, you know, like like the punishment might not necessarily be being locked up in in prison kind of thing. If somebody actually sort of drove away with it with a child and and you know didn't know it was there, the penalty might be a fine or community service or, or something different. We're not well, we're not giving out the punishments sort wait, of wait, wait, to wait, fit wait, the wait, crime. Wait, 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 wait. So, no, no. so if we go back to my earlier example about the person who kidnapped this other person and they had them in captivity for five years, okay? So yeah. you would say that there would be other ways like a fine in a case like that? No, I gave the direct example of somebody unknowingly drive, like stealing a car with the baby in it, for instance. You know, that, that's what was my example, right? Whoa. So other things that are not... Are not um, but, but do you think uh, like, a, like a certain amount of time behind bars would be proportionate with the kidnapping yeah. crime that they committed? Yeah, the mistake you're making is you're you're finding specific examples where, by coincidence, like just coincidentally, well, I mean it's not really coincidence, but you've sort of the the, the punishment's going to be the punishment kind of thing, like we're going to lock them up in prison, and you're sort of finding an example from a crime to fit that, and say, well, you can't accept that because the crime, the punishment fits the crime exactly, and that's what I'm arguing for. It's the reasons why we're implementing it. The fact that the, the the crime sort of fits it, as you're sort of saying, is completely incidental. It's got nothing to do with why we're doing it. Because I think that somebody think that so. commits... So. Hang on, hang on, let me finish, let me finish. Someone that commits Grand Theft Auto, for instance, I think they should be locked up. And that doesn't fit the crime. That, that, that They haven't kidnapped anybody. I still think they should be locked up. Um, if somebody assaults somebody else... They should be locked up. That doesn't fit the crime. The fact that someone is kidnapped is is purely incidental to them being locked up. It's it's the utility we get out of locking them up, so they can't kidnap anybody else. That is the important thing. Not that the result is the same as the crime they committed. Well, locking up like one way we would deal with somebody like, uh, and it, it just depends on what kind of country you live in. In other countries, if you steal something, you get your hand chopped off. <laughs> sure, I don't agree with that either. So, I'm sorry? I don't agree with that either. Well, well, why not? So you, 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 don't, well, you don't think... You, you, wait a minute. Aren't, so don't you believe that whatever punishment happens should fit the crime? Because presumably I would like to think you would disagree with that because it doesn't fit the crime in your view, right? I would disagree with it because it's completely unnecessary. It, it, it's just cruel and unusual punishment as far as I know. Because it doesn't fit, maybe? No. It's unnecessary because you can oh, stop so them from stealing without chopping their hands off. So, so it has nothing to do with fitting the crime? No, not really. It's, it's to do with a remedy for the problem in society. You know, if, if you're sort of going, do you think they should have their hands cut off, Tom Lock? Well, hold on. Wait, 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 wait. No, no, no. So, that's a question. That's a question. Do you think they should have their hands cut chopped off? Um, I wouldn't necessarily be against it. No. Okay. I, I think that would, you know, sort of be really cruel and barbaric. But, you know, you do you, I guess. But, again, I'm just going back to... I'm kind of at a loss to where you're not... 
looking at what would fit the actual crime because you're seeing the art because do, do you even believe in a notion of fit punishment at all or does that even not go into your vocabulary? It has nothing to do with what fits or not. Well, I'm sort of using your the, the way you're talking about fit, sort of, so that the it's sort of an eye for an eye. Um, it sort of is is a um, well, sort of a punishment that what is, think, is not what I think. What do you think? Do you believe in? Yeah, and I'm I'm talking. The idea I'm that talking, the punishment fits. Yeah, so Tom Lock, Lock, Tom Lock, let let me finish. Let me finish because I'm talking about my interpretation of what you're saying. I'm not talking about what you think. I'm talking about how I'm, I'm interpreting what you're saying. So you're saying like it should fit people that kill somebody should be killed. That is what I'm talking about, the eye for an eye version of fit. I think a punishment should be appropriate for the crime. So if you, you know, steal an apple, you only get a fine. If you, if you, you know, kill somebody, you should get life imprisonment. You know, that that's what I'm talking about. Well, that appropriate seems like punishment. just another form of fit. You're just using you're just using a different token, appropriate, but that seems okay. to just so, be a distinction so what, without a real difference. Okay, so what term should I use for an eye for an eye punishment kind of thing that you're talking about? I think eye for an eye is also appropriate. I mean, I think you could use okay. either one; it's interchangeable. So if um, I think you're just somebody... using a different token to say the same thing. That's all I'm getting at. Well, uh, when I was talking about a fit, I was talking about an eye for an eye punishment. And you don't believe yeah. in that in all cases, correct? I mean, you, yes, I do. Do you believe? Yeah, I do. So you believe if somebody's, I don't have a problem with that. So if you believe if somebody's raped, they should be raped in turn. I'm sorry? You believe if somebody is raped by somebody, their punishment is that person should be raped? Um, well, that person should be killed. But that's not an eye for an eye. Well, yes, it, yes, it is. How so? They they rape somebody and then they're killed. That's not an eye for an eye. That's a eye for a nose. That's that's not the same thing. Well, um, in the biblical worldview, that's very much an eye for an eye because God takes uh, sexual sins very seriously, and that would be rape would be considered a violation of someone's. Uh, autonomy, if you will, because you like to talk about autonomy in the biblical sense, sure. that would be eye for an eye. Maybe not in your view, it's not, but in the biblical sense, it definitely is. That's so weird because that's not what I think of when it's like an eye for an eye. It sort of means that, you know, if somebody takes your eye, you take their eye. If somebody takes your tooth, you take their tooth. It's not like if somebody takes an eye, you, you take their finger, or somebody steals something, you take their hands. The whole thing about eye for an eye is just a way to express. Um, it's just a way to express that what you do somebody else uh, will be done to you. It doesn't necessarily have to mean um, eye for an eye in that like strict sense. Like if you take someone else's eye, perhaps what will be taken from you is something equivalent. Like let's say um, maybe. Uh, maybe the, their eye was very valuable to them, and maybe your foot is very valuable to you. You know, eye for an eye, it's just, it's just a, a way to express um, what you do to someone else is going to be done to you, essentially. It, it doesn't necessarily have to be eye for an eye in that strict sense, but um, if you, like, okay. violate somebody, like, it, mm -hmm. I, it, it, like, if you violate somebody with, like, rape, um, yeah. what's going to be done to you is something that's going to meet that level of violation, such as your life being yeah. taken. Yeah, so that sort of falls into this idea of retributive justice kind of thing, um, that you, you do not... to somebody what is done yeah. to you. I don't have, yeah. I don't have no, a problem I... with that. Okay. Um, it's just, it's, it's like, so you, you've got two types. You've got the retributive justice and you've got the... Um, the um, um, rehabilitative justice. Um, and as, as I sort of pointed out, the rehabilitative seems to be a lot more effective in stopping people from committing crimes, or at least encourage them not to commit crimes. Um, so, you know, I, I, I get what you're saying, um, but I think that sort of, um, you know, in the case of something like rape, putting them in prison is is sort of, you know, enough punishment. Um, 
yeah so i i i i would i would submit that it's an, enough punishment and actually it sort of has a utility to it that a death penalty won't get you anything extra as far as i'm concerned well oh suppose uh that you you put you put someone uh they only raped one person right ever period do you think they should be put behind bars for life you should, should they language behind prison for life for that in your view uh sorry I, I, what was the situation if they they raped yeah, one they only person? Raped, yeah they only raped the one person um, should they languish in prison for life for that i think it, it depends on the severity of the crime like was it violent was it you know do they express remorse for it and and genuine remorse or at least apparently genuine remorse i think there's a lot there that you'd have to sort of dissect and and sort of you know take apart oh. um well what does justice have to do with anything and whether they express remorse or not because you earlier you told me uh they're not really looking at the feelings of the family to adjudicate justice but n now it seems like you're sort of taking a different stance where you're looking at their feelings to adjudicate justice in this sense yeah because we're, we're trying to figure out whether they can be re rehabilitated or not um in into society so not necessarily but maybe yeah if if the punish if the crime is severe enough then yes life in prison well, what, would, what would what would have what would have what would that have to do with their personal feelings about it that wouldn't necessarily be justice then would it well that's not really their personal feelings that's being taken into account um we're taking into account remorse which is sort of um whether they are apologizing or, or or wanting to make up for that wrong that they have done I don't know um, that's, that's wait a minute how is that not connected to their feelings though well i mean if they're willing to apologize for what they've done and sort of say i'm sorry for what i have done right i mean they could be sorry all day they could be sorry all day long but well, at the no, at at the cost at the cost of what they could be sorry all day long. I mean, uh, let, let's say Hitler himself was put behind bars. He could be sorry all day mm -hmm. long. Sure. Well, so what is that? Sure. And if the, well, if the crime is harsh enough, it won't have any effect on it. Sure, but it's a demonstration of of wanting um, wanting to convince the court that they won't do it again in the future. Um, that that is what it is. So, and whether if, the court believes it so or not is a completely another story. You know, so, if so they're not. So, yeah. so presumably, let's just say, presumably, if someone like a Hitler was put in the court, and he managed mm -hmm. to convince the court that he would never do what he'd done ever again, you think it would be justice to potentially let somebody like that out again? Probably not. No, I think I would. I would say that somebody like that life imprisonment would would be the way. In fact, we have some people that are still in prison. Like the the person behind the Bosnian um, genocide is still in prison in in the Hague, I believe, in Netherlands. Uh, oh, or... so. Uh, I suppose yeah. you shouldn't have a problem with uh, eternal punishment then in, in the in the case of something like that, because uh, that would be uh, a kind of sin that you can characterize to where there there would be eternally punished. I guess you well, shouldn't have I a mean, problem with that then, should you? <laughs> eternal punishment for what? For, I mean, I mean, because if you're talking about somebody languishing like a Hitler for mass murder, what well, if you take you know, God's view of eternal punishment for something similar. Like, well, I mean, okay, so this is this is getting like way into a, a tangent, but um, eternal I, I, punishment. I, 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 to... I was just sidetrack. I was just kind of getting you to consider. Yeah, Wouldn't yeah, and I'll, I mean, I'll answer. I'll answer. Well, internal punishment or infinite punishment. Um, there is no crime that I could commit that has infinite harm done. So, yeah, that's a bit harsh for having done nothing, infinite punishment. In fact, there's nothing I could do during my life which would warrant in infinite punishment. 
I've already acknowledged that the severity of the punishment should be commensurate with with the crime, but you're talking about infinite punishment, so but, that is <laughs> impossible dude, for me to. If this dude, if this dude is never going to get out, then um, yeah, are you are if it's if he's never going to get out, how is that any different than the person who will never get out of hell? Like, is it is it because but, that this dude has a finite lifespan? Is that literally your only thing? Is that he has a finite sure. lifespan? Sure. And that the, he is removed That's from all. society because we get that utility of having it removed from society so it can't affect society. So um, the whole idea of um, infinite punishment would mean that I've, I've committed an infinite crime on Earth, and I don't know how that works. I don't know what I'd do to begin well, to... Well, there's a couple of ways you can hash that out in the Christian worldview. Number one okay. is home you've sinned against is an infinitely holy god so that's one way you can weigh an infinite crime another wow. way you can look at it is the per the person who's in hell i mean it'll be like this if somebody mm -hmm. uh murdered somebody and let's just say they got 10 years and while they were mm -hmm. in prison they murdered somebody else and they got like 30 years on top of that and then they murder somebody else, and they just kept on murdering. They they're just gonna keep getting sentences stacked, 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 and stacked. So they're never gonna mm -hmm. get out because they keep doing stuff. And hell, uh, there's this notion, presumably, that people would be sorry about what they've done. And I don't think that's necessarily biblically true. I think a person in hell who's gonna be uh, in the state that they chose to be in because of their continuous sort of wickedness and sinfulness against God, they're going to be eternally cursing God forever. And that's going to, you know, just impact their sins all the more eternally because they're never going to stop cursing God. So yeah, if they're I, I never going to stop cursing God, then their punishment is going to continue on into eternity. That's the whole point. Yeah, so you're saying that they could accept God after they die. Is that right? Uh, I don't see any biblical justification for that, no. Okay, so they can't accept God after they die. I'm sorry? So they can't accept God after they die. No, no, their fate, their fate is sealed. So you've but, got to do it before they die. Yes, their but fate I'm is sealed. I'm, I'm, so I'm just saying, that means I'm, I'm that there is, nothing, there is nothing you can choose to do to extend your, your situation. If you can't accept no, um, no. Jesus after you die, then that's not up to you. Your your sentence is being add on, added on for something that you have no control over, which is inherently unjust. Well, well, well that's why I gave you two views. Number one, whom you're sinning against, the infinitely holy God, and two, the fact that okay. you just don't stop sinning at all anyway. So you, you'd be caught in eternal punishment on either count. Um, well, I think I think that an eternal God would have to be demonstrated to me, and an eternal God that punishes me for using the logic and rationality and reasoning that apparently this God is supposed to have given me, according to Christians. Um, really, I mean, I, I don't see how it's it's my problem um, if if well, they I mean, don't convince me that they exist. exist or not, it's a separate question. I'm just talking about. Just the view well, does itself. A, does a God I'm want me to know view. that they exist? Well, if if you, if you take the sort of revelatory view that I have, um, yeah. he has made it very clear to every person that he exists, and that those Ooh, do they and, and those, want me? And those who, I'm sorry. Do they want me to know that they exist? They, they meaning who? Who, who, who do you mean they like? The, the God. Uh, like, the, like the God of the Scripture has already made Himself known to you through the Bible, at the very least. Well, I, I don't know, about, know that a God exists. Well, um, when you when you say you don't, when you say you don't know, then you're just yeah. simply reject. You, then you're just simply rejecting what's uh, conveyed in the Scripture, and which no, means, no, I'm not. Well, well, yes, you are because uh, no. the Bible has made it very clear that He's made Himself known to every person. Oh, I, I don't. Once, I right? don't believe in this. Yeah, I don't believe in the scripture, so I don't know why oh, I would take that well, as any well, that kind would of mean, evidence. Well, let me well, finish, Tom Locke. Let me finish. Let me finish. I don't know why I'd take that as any kind of evidence. 
because if that God doesn't exist, then it's not uh, a God saying that they exist. It's men that have written it that are wrong. So basically, I am I am taking the uh, rational point of saying you have to demonstrate to me that this God exists, or if the God exists, they have to demonstrate that the God exists. Because there's plenty of holy books out there, and we don't say that everyone, you know, the God of everyone exists because it's in a holy book. That has to be demonstrated to be the case, and God hasn't demonstrated Himself to me. Well, do you, do you hold to the supremacy of human reasoning as? your ultimate foundation for how you reason anything at all no 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 okay so it, 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 it is, is god your ultimate appeal for how you reason no no absolutely not well then you're either gonna have either something either you're gonna have something beyond yourself that you hold to as the ultimate authority for reason or you're going to hold humans as the ultimate authority for reason. There's no third option. You've been talking to Darth Dawkins or something. <laughs> okay, so here it is. Um, so what's the so what's the third option? Okay, so basically, I appeal to an ultimate reality, an absolute reality. Um, basically, that is the um, reality that has to be there, and I'll explain to you how I know that it is the case that that reality exists. Now, it may be that that absolute reality is in fact a God, but I'm not making that assertion, you are. So you've got to demonstrate that that ultimate reality is in fact a God, because I make no real hard claim on what it is. I do it in, you know, sort of know what my apparent reality is. I'm sitting here talking to you. I'm in my room. You know, all of these things is my apparent well, reality. Are, I make are you no reasoning? Just... Are you reasoning at all? Are you reasoning at all? What do you mean, sorry? Am I reasoning at all? Uh, do, do you just reason anything, period? Do you make any propositional claims? Do you do if this, then oh, that? Yeah. Do you do any kind? Yeah. Sure. Well, I presuppose things like um, my senses, you know, the accuracy of my fine, senses, fine. even though I know that they're, they're thing. I, I presuppose yeah. things like the logical absolutes, which then leads me to reasoning, which then leads me to, you know, sort of induction and logical claims. Um, you know, I, I presuppose okay. all of those things. Yeah. As do you, I, I would presume. So, so, it, so you definitely don't hold the God of the Bible as your ultimate authority for how you reason, clearly, correct? No. No, not at yeah, all. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, so so you know that for a fact. All right. What so you mean I know it for a fact. What do you mean by that? Well, I mean you said definitely no. Yeah, now, I, I don't I, hold to that at all. No. Well, if you're I know my own if, mind. If you're making that as a definite, I say that from your standpoint, you seem to know that for a fact that you do not. Why would I not know what I think? Yeah, so so you so you're definite about okay. that. So, so you've switched, oh, you're making on, a category on, error. On, no, Tonlock, you're making a category error. You're trying to switch from what I believe I, to what is true in actuality. Those are two different things. You can't switch oh, over no, from sir. epistemology no, to that. ontology. I, I didn't, well, then I didn't what are you talking all. about? I, I know that for a fact. Of course I, I know I'm what just, I think for a fact. I'm just talking about what's coming out of your mouth, sir. That's all I'm saying. Can I, can I just uh, try and clear things up for you guys really quick? I, I think, yeah, uh, think Tonlock, you might be trying to speak to the assumption that he might be making some sort of hard atheistic stance here. Is that I the am. case? I'm sorry? Well, I'm, that's that's for a question more for Tonla. Are, are, you, are you trying to get at the point that he's trying to make some sort of a hard atheistic stance here in terms of how he's grounding his senses? Yeah, all I'm saying is that if he talks about how he reasons at all, either that's going to mm. be due to some sort of um, purposeful sort of ultimate context, or it's going to be due to just um, something identified that's subject to chance. What? No, I, I presuppose the logical absolutes. Are you, are you aware of the logical absolutes? Well, the logical absolutes, are you talking about the three fundamental laws of logic, law of non-contradiction, yes. uh, law of identity, excluded middle? Yes. Okay, well, these are abstractions in and of themselves. They well, really, they they really have no they have no sort of like, I mean if if you hold the, if you hold these things to be ultimate in and of themselves, then I never did. Well, 
well, I told you, well, you that you're... absolute reality was ultimate time. Well, I said that very well, clearly. Absolutely. What I said was that I presuppose these logical absolutes. Do you reject the logical see, absolutes? Why, why are you? See, you didn't want me to over talk. You need to start over talking me, sir. OK, I'm sorry. Yeah, you're right. OK. OK. So you clearly have some means for how you reason. Well, I'm asking you, is it identifiable? Whatever this means of reason is, is it identifiable at all? Yes. So I presuppose the logical absolutes because um, using logic to prove logic is kind of a circular argument. And then I apply that to, to my apparent reality. What makes something true or not is when that reasoning applied to my apparent reality matches an absolute reality. That is when it becomes fundamentally true. Now, it may be that, that that absolute reality is, in fact, a God, which you need to prove. It may be that that absolute reality is identical to my apparent reality. It may be somewhere in between. It may be someplace. I'm not making a claim on an absolute reality, just that one exists. You are making yeah. the claim of what that is. So you need to back up that claim with showing there is actually a God that that is that reality behind everything. Okay, so in other words, this ultimate reality you're stipulating is unidentifiable as of right now. Is that correct? Is it unidentifiable? I don't know. That's true. It may be in the future. I, I'm not sure it is now. Well, um, right, I, right. I oh, have you know, to based on a name. That's what well, I'm saying. Come lock, come lock. Don't in, like. Come on, man. Um, yeah, yeah, you're right. Go at ahead. the moment. I presuppose my senses are accurate, so I presuppose that the apparent reality is the absolute reality that I'm looking at. But if, you, if you're talking about, and I think there is, like, when you're talking about knowledge, you're talking about sort of a, a reasonable level of certainty. I don't think you need absolute knowledge in order to have some knowledge. So um, I... Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I don't know sort of what... Um, what you mean by that because um you know what's true is what comports with an absolute reality and not my apparent reality but i i act as a presupposition that my senses are correct and that the logical absolutes work so i can interact with that reality but that's not quite why i'm asking you you're kind of talking around what i'm asking you like i'm just asking you a simple question is this reference point from how you reason is it old this ultimate reference point is it identifiable or not it may be i don't know well saying that it may be it's just uh, a word salad of way of saying that you have not identified it at this point how is that word salad because um i didn't ask you well well i don't know i said have you i'm asking you have you identified it at this point I might have. Well, you're you're you're, you're um, kind of giving me a worse solid answer, and that's kind of slimy. Well, I I might have. Well, that's sir. not word salad. No, no, well, you well, asked think, me if it think, was. Think, no, no, no. About, you asked me whether it about, was. It could be. It could think, be. Think, um, think about if we're just talking about a normative yeah. experience. Like, did you go to the club last night? I might have. Like, that's sure. kind of a sleazy answer, bro. Why don't you? That's, you just gave me a sleazy answer. Like, either you have identified this ultimacy at this point, or you haven't. Which is it? Well, if if my apparent reality is the absolute reality, as I said before, then I have. If it's not, then I haven't. It's very easy to understand, Tom Locke. I don't know why so, you're having a problem with this. The, the um, but I think reality, I think I think I, what I want to do is say what I will, what I want to do is say if and I asked you a question that I noticed that you studiously ignored. Are you rejecting the that the, 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 our senses are true or the the logical absolutes? Do you reject those or not? I do want an answer, please. I don't reject logical absolutes at all, and I can okay. even grant you. For the sake of this argument that you have logical absolutes, I can grant you that. But that still doesn't senses? really. I can. Even, I'll grant you that too. I'll grant you okay, that too. For so the you... Sake of this, I'll, grant, I'll grant you all of that for the sake of this argument. Yep. I just want to know, um, from what is the ultimate identifiable reference point from which you reason so, from? Either it's it. Well, hold on. Either it's identifiable or it's not. 
So well, what you've just sir. done, what you've just done is you've acknowledged that my senses are describing an absolute reality. Therefore, I know exactly what it is through my senses. And you've also acknowledged that um, logic, logical absolutes exist, which lead to reasonability and rationality, meaning that I can interpret them in such a way to make coherence out of my environment. So congratulations, you've just shown how I can I function didn't ask well. you. I didn't ask you if I asked you earlier if you can reason, which you said you could. And mm -hmm. um, I, I didn't ask you if your senses function correctly. I didn't ask you. It, I, didn't, I didn't like ask you again about um, what, what yeah. was the other thing you said? You, 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 so, yeah. So the uh, these presuppositions that I'm using, somebody has to sort of you have to validate them in order to use them. And you've just validated both of them. Which right, sort I, of didn't, I, I didn't ask the you position. that either. I didn't ask you that either. Well, it doesn't I matter. Just, you answered my question. I said, do you reject their existence? You, if sir. you acknowledge their existence, then you have validated both of I can, them. Sir, I, I can I can grant I can grant you that you use these fundamental laws of logic. What I asked you is, mm -hmm. um, is there an identifiable source of ultimate reality in which Yeah, absolute reality. And if if my senses are valid, which you've already validated, then I have access to that and know what it is. So yeah, well, that that doesn't answer the question because I can say the same thing. Absolute reality you is what I the same thing. From. So if I absolute if I say the same reality thing, that, is what I, you reason sir, from. That's an that that's an un that's an that's an unidentifiable abstraction like. If I if I said the same thing and you said the same thing, then okay. we're not explaining anything specific. I asked you right. an, an identifiable source. Which I don't. Which I don't. I don't I don't explain anything about it. It just is. Oh okay, like I so don't, at this time, I don't well, let me finish. I, I don't make I don't give any attributes to that whatsoever unless unless my senses are validated in such a way that I can use them to start applying the label to those that 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 thing that I'm seeing. So when my senses are validated as true, then what I can say is that absolute reality has the things that my senses are taking in, like, you know, it has a pen in front of me and it has this over here and it has this over here. And then when the ad logical absolutes come in, I can say, hey, everything that is this pen is this pen and everything that's not this pen is not this pen, right? I can start to make sense of everything around me. But I don't go backwards and say, hey, the absolute reality is anything in particular. You're starting with, you know what the, log the, the absolute reality is. And I'm asking you to justify that claim, not try to shift the burden of proof onto me. Well, here's the issue. If your uh, reference point from which you reason is not identifiable, then how do you how, how do you know that you're not reasoning from just a world of chance? You wouldn't be it able to justify them. Well, Well, what is it? It's the physical world that I inhabit around me as per your validation of my senses. The physical world is ultimate? No, no, the absolute reality that my senses is describing. Because in validating my senses, you have validated that they are true. And therefore, if absolute reality is that which is true, then you, I am describing that absolute reality with my senses. That would be like if you ask me, what, what is your favorite sport? What, is, what sport do you like the most? And then I told you, well, my favorite sport. If that's all I said, I didn't give you exactly what my favorite sport is. I didn't say anything. I asked you mm -hmm. about the ultimate reality, specifically that's identifiable, and you just said ultimate reality again. You just really state you just say the same thing yeah. over again. You you, you tripped up me. there in sort of a, a sort of you know a favorite sport is sort of preferential. It's not ontological. Like you you've, you've completely messed up there. It doesn't matter if it's preferential or ontological. The fact is, it does. If I don't if I don't no no it doesn't because the whole point is. I, analogies aren't meant to prove stuff. It's only meant to uh, let you know what the principle. They don't have to walk on all fours. The principle is getting you to tell, getting you, getting me to tell you something specific, not just simply say, "Well, my favorite sport." It's getting, it's getting into specificity. 
when I'm asking you about ultimate reality and you just say, well, ultimate reality again, that doesn't mm -hmm. explain anything. That doesn't tell me anything uh, specific. Well, it doesn't really matter because I'm not making specific claims on it. You are. So again, again, I'll go back to, can you back up your specific claims on this reality? Go well, the it. problem is if you're not making any specific point about ultimate reality, uh -huh. then you don't have any basis to make any claims whatsoever because for all you know, you could be reasoning in a world of chance. And if you tell me something like, well, I haven't justified my claim, well, based on what? No sort of uh, reference point for no. ultimate reality in which you can even evaluate any assertion. You don't have any justification to say I have or I haven't backed up anything because you have nothing sure to I stand do. Sure I do. You validated my senses and the logical absolutes. Of course I do. I make well, those presuppositions, but you validated them. So then I do well, that's, uh, as that, far as these, we're concerned. These are, these, are lo these are local, sir. I asked you about ultimate reality, which you didn't give me any specificity for. Correct. So you so you're so all I can stipulate is that either you have something specific or you may be reasoning in a world of chance. You don't have any third option. No, because you've validated my senses as being true. So it can't be a world of chance. It has to be the well, one. Well, your where senses I, are yes, local, not Tom ultimate. Lock, please. Tom Locke, Tom Locke, calm down. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it has to be one that my senses are describing. And, you know, sort of you, you've already given me that and you've already given me the logical absolute. So they are enough to function in this apparent reality, which you're sort of acknowledging through your validation that my senses are true and the logical absolutes are true is the absolute reality. So that's These it. These are local, um, not ultimate, sir. I doesn't actually, matter. Well, doesn't matter. I, There's no yes, difference. It, There's no yes, difference yes, at all. Yes, when you're talking does. about absolute, it can't now, now be you're over talking That me makes again. no sense. Now you're over talking no me again. Sense. Now you're over talking me again. I ask you very yeah, specifically. Is you're over, you're really. over talking me again. Now I ask you very specifically about do you have an identifiable, specific, specified ultimate reality? And you just give me these sorts of locals. I grant you the local ones. I ask you about the specified ultimate. And you don't have any specified ultimate, do you? Yeah, you don't get ultimates that are local. Ultimates are ultimate. They, they're applicable everywhere and, and they are the base foundation for everything. So when you're sort of saying a local ultimate, you're just you're making meaningless sounds. It's like I a married bachelor. It doesn't mean said. anything. I That's essentially what you're saying. So whether no, 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 or I not I can I I know that. what that I is. Really yeah, that. Tonlock, Tonlock, Tonlock. Now you're doing it. Um, it doesn't matter whether or not I know what that absolute reality is. I can demonstrate that exists. But you validating my senses and the logical absolutes have given me everything that I need to show that the apparent reality around me is the absolute reality I experience. If you are making the claim, and again, we'll go to it again, if you're making the claim that something else is there and more specificity, you have to demonstrate this. And this is the last time I'm going to ask this because I've asked it again and again and again, and you refuse to go there. You keep, keep shifting the burden of proof back onto me. You need to demonstrate this in some way. So can you do that or not? Okay, I have no problem with demonstrating it, but so. I, have to, I have to point out some things here. Number one, I didn't say no, 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 no. Do that Stop. first. Hey, and then wait, we'll wait, get wait, back wait, wait. No, see, no, no, no. I've you're, asked this three or four times. Me. Now you're over talking me. Now you're over talking me. Okay, I tried to be respectful to you. Now you're over talking me again. Are you going to let me speak? Well, I want you to do the demonstration first, speak? not to anything else. Anything else. But you never answered no, do my the demonstration question, first. But you never answered my question, though. The point is, you never answered my question. I, asked I, you I about answered very all of your questions. No, you did not. I asked you about a very specific, specified ultimacy, and you never answered that question. What you did was is just repeat the same, same thing. Well, ultimate reality. You... You didn't, spec you didn't specify anything whatsoever, so you never actually answered my question. Now, you want me to demonstrate something. You want me to engage with you, I would presume, in good faith, but you don't want to engage with me back in good faith and actually answer a simple question. So if I, I tell you what my specificity. If, if I tell you what my specified ultimate is, you know where I'm coming from, a very specific sure. biblical point of view. 
So sure. my ultimate reference point, how I reason is the God of the Holy Scripture. So you know what I'm talking about. I okay. don't know what That's you're right. talking about when you talk about how you can reason out. I don't know what you're talking about. You never answered the it, question. Yes, I did. I said that it could be God. It could be something else. It could be anything. That's it is an specified. ultimate reality. But I don't have access to that ultimate. It doesn't matter. It doesn't need to be specified. The fact that you're that the one claiming. Uh, like, excuse me. Excuse me. You're, just because you're the one claiming to know what it is, that puts the burden of proof squarely on you. And you dodge and you duck and you won't answer the question of how you know that. You won't answer any demonstration to prove that this is actually the case. All you do is shift the burden of proof and say, hey, you're not specifying anything, so you've got to specify something. No, that is not the way any logic works anywhere in the world. If, if I say, hey, I don't know what's in the next room, and you say, hey, there's a giraffe in the next room, and I say, how do you know that? You don't turn around and say, well, you haven't specified anything. You haven't claimed there's an elephant in the next room, so you've got to do that first. No, that's not the case. If I genuinely don't know with 100% certainty what the the um a absolute is that doesn't mean you you can say basically you have to commit to something no that is not how that works that is shifting the burden of proof so um when i say like sort of you grant me my senses are true i.e describing an absolute reality which is the truth and um, the logical absolutes are true, which is describing the interactions of of uh, um, entities within the the truth, which is absolute reality. Then you have given me all the specificity I need. The fact that you're then going back and saying, hey, you have to specify something is not only completely illogical as far as we think about logical applications of whether we know things or not. It is also just a dodge that you can't demonstrate your God is the ultimate. You're doing a lot of talking around the point, and it's obvious that you're doing a lot of talking oh, around the point. addressed it directly. Oh, okay. oh, wait, 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 wait. Because I gave you the local stuff, like your senses functioning correctly. Like, that's the local stuff. I granted you that. I asked you very specifically about a specified ultimate in which you can reason from. And you never answered that question and you think you have the authority to tell me, well, I need to justify X or I need to do this. You don't have any yeah. authority to stand on to make any of these claims that you assert. If you say you I need to you justify better wrap it up, X, yeah, then he's not going to answer on, questions, I wasn't, so, see, I yeah. wasn't, see, you overtaught me. If you're going yeah. to try to stand on any kind of a, an authority, because when you say I need to justify mm -hmm. X, you're standing on some sort of authority. When you say I need to um demonstrate x you're standing on some sort of an authority which you don't even tell me what that authority is so from your point of view you may be you you may be reasoning from a world of chance while you're trying to lecture me uh, and try to speak from a position of authority you don't have any grounds to say anything against me or yeah. what i should or shouldn't do so until you yeah, until, so, uh, you, give that, until you give no, me that no, 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 i'm gonna Tom wrap, I'm gonna wrap okay, it up no wrap it up yeah until so maybe maybe we should okay. get this I'm gonna okay, wrap yeah. It up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. garbage out of here so, so um, Mark, see, yeah because he's not going to answer my question i've think? asked how like you know he right he didn't answer my question no he didn't even answer i my did i question. did no you didn't okay. 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 i did i asked you do you have a do you have a specified ultimate you never answered that question okay so so tom i think he he answered the question uh the way that he's going to answer the question, right? So you're not going to get any other kind of answer. Um, I asked him about specified ultimate. He didn't answer right? the question. He, I answered. he answered. He answered, right? So uh, that's he the didn't answer give me one. He didn't give me one. He, he gave yes, you an answer, right? So you're just not going to accept that, it. That's a it doesn't, that's a doesn't need to be specified. It doesn't need to be The, the a answer is... Okay. 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 Everyone stop. Tom Lock. Everyone stop. The answer is it doesn't need to be specified in order to be an ultimate. And you just won't accept that. Yeah. So, So. okay. Okay, so, can I speak now? Wait, this back and forth is got to stop because it's just going to keep going back and forth um uh that's the end of this uh, can i do a wrap okay. up for the the um sort of 
Um, yes, I, I do want to death give penalty positive. debate that we're supposed to be happening, but Tom Locke wants yes. to, you know, do his pre-sub song. And yes. Dance, so. No, I think yes, we I, did have that debate in specificity, but uh, yeah. there's okay. other things I, that connect I'm just to gonna, this. I'm just going to mute everybody for a second, just so that I can finish my little bit. Um, so I do want to give you both a quick chance to wrap up the, uh, a few minutes to wrap up the, uh, the death penalty stuff. So, um, Tonlock, why don't I let you, if you'd like to, uh, wrap up first, we'll give you five minutes and then Mark, if you want to do five minutes and then we can, um, maybe bring up some audience members to ask some questions, but Tonlock, please don't go back to this. Don't use your wrap up time to go back to this question. Um, we're just going to call the kibosh on this uh, philosophy question for now. Um, I know you feel like you didn't get the response you wanted, uh, but sometimes that's the way it goes with the debate. So uh, you've got five minutes uninterrupted. Mark's not going to interrupt you. Um, give your, your final five minutes of closing. Then Mark, you can give yours, and we'll go to q and A. I'm going to unmute you now. Tom. So go ahead. Oh, cool. Um, I always say one thing. I do appreciate my conversation with Mr. Mark Reed here. Uh, I think we touched on many important topics, uh, given the death penalty conversation. And I think uh, he has some certain he, ha he has many interesting points that I would definitely like to consider. And I would definitely like to look into that research that he was talking about in terms of deterrence. I would definitely like to look deeper into that, because um, even though I support the death penalty, it's not really something that's my primary focal point of study. So there's a lot of stuff that I need to look into regarding that. Uh, but what, what, what I will say is I do think on a very fundamental biblical level, it's good to have it because I hold to the fact that uh, God is the authority over all and God knows all and God knows best better than any one of us. I think, you know, any of our human reasons ultimately fall short to his wisdom. And I will hold him as the beacon and the foundation ultimately for how I reason. And I'm not going back to the, this, this last kind of conversation I had. I'm just saying that he's the ultimate reference point, how I reason, you know, any particular thing, whether it be the death penalty or anything else for that issue. But I will say, despite how our conversation ended, I very much did appreciate my discourse with Mr. Mark Reed, and I think for the most part he was cordial, and perhaps we can do it again sometime. And, you know, I'll land with that, and that's all. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Tom Luck, and thank you for stepping in um, at the last minute. We really appreciate that a lot. Uh, so, Mark, if you want to jump in and wrap up your uh, death penalty. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm just I'm just doing something. I'm, I'm I've, I've absolutely stuffed up OBS. Um, um, okay, so with the death penalty, really, what we're doing um, in modern society, if we don't sort of look at these these books with with punitive, you know, sort of things that we would consider barbaric, like stoning people to death and sort of these these horrible uh, treatments of people, is looking at having a, a system where we can get utility out of our institutions. So um, with, with the death penalty, it doesn't actually give us anything that we wouldn't get from lifetime imprisonment. In fact, it actually drains more resources because of the cost of it. Um, it's hard psychologically. It's something I didn't cover hard psychologically on the people that do do the executions. We're also expecting people to execute people on our behalf, which I don't think is is the right thing to do. Um, the whole idea that that we should um, sort of innocent people uh, are fine to be killed um, because it it sort of takes the worst away or people feel better about the situation isn't something that I would advocate. I would put it to you that um, any person killed unjustly far outweighs any feeling that could be gotten for um, sort of retribution or, or feeling better or feeling a sense of closure on 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 a crime. Um, I think that we need to follow the example of Finland and Norway and Sweden that really um, set their sights on a rehabilitative mode of, of justice and therefore stop people from um, committing crimes in the first place. Because if we're not going to analyse what actually stops crime, then your, your, the, the, the system that you're advocating for isn't 
being put in place um, to to stop crime. It's being put in place to take retribution on people. So if you want a world where there's less crime, then you should abolish the death penalty. If you want a world where there sort of is more crime, then go to the retributive, you know, sort of justice kind of, uh, I mean, I use that word mildly, but the, the retributive justice system that just hurts people because they hurt somebody else. So it depends what you want out of this. Um, and, you know, I don't believe in the Bible, so I don't think it has any authority and certainly doesn't have any authority over secular modern life. Nobody is going to um, sort of put, uh, well, nobody, very few people will want to put um, the the punishments of the Bible into practice, especially when it comes to, to sort of stoning people and things like that. It is an outdated book. It can't tell us how to live morally and we can do a way better job without it. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mark. Um, so with that wrapped up, I want to thank uh, everybody again. Thank you, Mark, and thank you, uh, Tom Luck, for uh, stepping up again at the last minute. Um, and I think uh, we will do some questions and answers, if that's OK with you guys. Um, if people in the yeah, audience absolutely. want to raise their hand. Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, so yeah, if people want to raise their hand and just engage with the speakers a little bit, um, we will do that. So if you're in the audience and have a journalist, you, um, you want to ask some questions? Um, yeah, I, I do. I uh, I want to ask a question to Mark. Um, like, would you say that the death penalty is more uh, like, it, more justifiable in the past where it wasn't as practical to like lock somebody up for life or um like mm. is your position like uh do you feel like it's more justifiable or come about more recently because it's uh now kind of like a leftover vestigial part of the system to have a, the death penalty yeah, I think it would have been more um, more justifiable in the past if we cannot in any way remove people from society. Um, I, I think that may be true, um, although um, I, I still sort of see it as immoral because it's not going to get you to a better society. Any society where the government kills people um, is not, in the long run, maybe in the short term it's a good idea, but in the long run it's not going to get you to a better society. Okay. Thanks. Uh, that was my uh, my one question that I had. Thanks, Janet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, anything you want to add, uh, Tom? Look. Uh, not at this time, no. Okay. Um. Anybody else have any questions? It looks like question um, and answer ever. You can put yeah. it in the side chat if somebody doesn't want to come up. That that's fine. Yeah, if you don't want to talk, okay. um, go ahead and uh, you can just write it in the side chat. Some people don't want to talk on mic. Thanks, Jonas. Oh, uh, in the interim, if I may say something real quick, uh, this, like I said. I, I definitely enjoyed this conversation with Mark. It's not really my main focal point of study. Um, I mainly like the big, the actual pro-life issue, you know, the abortion topic. So uh, I would definitely like to debate that with anybody at any time, if anybody would be game. I can debate that. Oh. I'm, I'm on the pro, pro-choice. I know, not, obviously not this time, but, you know, some other time in the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I get you. I get you. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, I yeah, we'll we'll sort something out. I mean, it's a debate server. Debates will happen. All right, and also hey, down no to questions, oh, man. I, I want to answer at least one question. That's too bad. Yeah, they spent themselves in chat earlier debating all kinds of other stuff. Yeah. All right. Well, it was actually a really good conversation. I think. Um, 
you guys yeah i want to say thank you to Tom for, for a lot of really... content yeah. Well, I just I just want to say thanks, Tom, for really coming through at the last minute and providing the the opposition. It was really good talking to you. I, I don't hold any animosity at all. I know that. Oh no, very definitely not. It's all good. I, all good. I, oh, for um, sure. Like I said, I think you're a very smart dude. You're very cordial, and I definitely appreciate the conversation as well. So yeah, no hard feelings at all, man. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, awesome. And Yaden, thanks so much for coming in and, and moderating. You're an absolute champ and, you know, you are an awesome moderator, i, I got to say. Yeah, well, until until the very end, there was nothing to really do. Um, but, uh, but thank you guys very much. And thank, thanks, everybody in the audience for joining us. And uh, we'll see you again real soon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.